My name is Michael Taylor, the director of the Hood Museum of Art at Dartmouth College, and it gives me immense pleasure to welcome you to today's panel. We're so thrilled that you could be with us today. Uh, we celebrate, of course, tonight the opening of the exhibition Crossing Cultures, the Owen and Wagner Collection of Contemporary Aboriginal Art at the Hood Museum of Art. And today's panel discussion is called Together Alone, Politics of Indigeneity and Culture in Australia. Thank you to everyone who has traveled from many parts of the globe to be with us this afternoon. So you will forgive us for starting 10 minutes late. And we look forward to a very rich intellectual exchange. We will offer more formal exhibition remarks upstairs in the galleries. But for now, I wish to acknowledge and thank the co-sponsors of today's panel discussion, the Office of the Provost, the Museum Lecture Series Fund, the Leslie Center for the Humanities, the Dickey Center for International in Understanding and Native American Studies. We simply couldn't do this without you. We have in the audience today also Will Owen and Harvey Wagner. And I will ask them to stand up. <laughs> I don't even have to say this bit, but I might as well because you know it all. Um, we can't thank them enough for the extraordinary gift of the Owen and Wagner Collection of Aboriginal Australian Art at the Hood Museum of Art. We consider our collection a global collection, and we think that this is a transformative gift that will benefit the faculty, the students, and the local community in the Upper Valley for generations to come. You'll get more remarks upstairs, but we couldn't leave this one alone. So thank you. It's a pleasure to have you here. So it's now my great pleasure to introduce the exhibition's curator and the organizer and moderator of this panel, Stephen Gilchrist, who is the curator of Indigenous Australian Art at the Hood Museum of Art. Stephen, Stephen is from uh, the Yamaji people of Northwestern, Northwest Western Australia. Before arriving at Dartmouth in September 2011, Stephen held curatorial appointments at the National Gallery of Victoria in Melbourne and the National Gallery of Australia in Canberra. In 2011, he collaborated with artist Rico Rennie on curating the exhibition Pata Nation at the Kluge, I never get that right, Kluge Ru Aboriginal Art Collection at the University of Virginia. And he wrote the, the brochure for that exhibition as well. Most recently, Stephen was a consultant and essayist for the Seattle Art Museum's exhibition that just closed in early September called Ancestral Modern Australian Aboriginal Art from the Kaplan and Levy Collection. Please now join me in welcoming Stephen Gilchrist, who will introduce the themes of today's panel and its distinguished speakers. Stephen. Thank you, Michael. I firstly want to acknowledge the customary owners of the land we're now standing on and pay my respects to their ancestors. Is this, can you hear me? Not really? Is this better? Um, I, I also want to um, extend my welcome to the people who've traveled across oceans in some cases, um, and to thank them for being here, and thank you for being here for our exhibition and our discussion um, today. I wanted to introduce my dream team. I have two out of three, which is good at the moment. Um, you know, who represent different disciplines, different ways of knowing, different cultural backgrounds, and very distinguished international careers. Brenda Croft is from the Gurindji Mulga Mudpura people um, in the Northern Territory, and was the former senior curator of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander art at the National Gallery of Australia. She was a founding member of Bomali, co-curator of the 1997 Venice Biennale representing Emily, Kama and Ware, and is currently a senior research fellow with the National Institute for Experimental Arts, the College of Fine Arts, Sydney. Sonia Smolacombe is a member of the Maramaminji people from the Daly River area. Sonia's work focuses on the stolen generations, intellectual and cultural property rights for Indigenous peoples. Um, prior to joining the United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues, Sonia was a senior lecturer in the School of Australian Indigenous Knowledge Systems at Charles Darwin University. Um, Christian Thompson, who will join us shortly, uh, 
is a contemporary artist and is, has exhibited his photographs, videos and performance works in numerous solo and group exhibitions nationally and internationally. He is one of the first two Aboriginal students to study at the University of Oxford, London, uh, Oxford, in its history, thanks to the Charlie Perkins Scholarship Program. He's studying his um, doctorate in fine art at the Ruskin School of Drawing and Fine Art. And please welcome them to the Hood Museum of Art. <coughs> Unfortunately, Hedy Perkins, um, who was listed as one of the panelists, couldn't make it today, but she is present in a number of ways, um, particularly in her role as presenter of the Art and Soul documentary um, that's playing upstairs in the exhibition space. And I invite you to spend um, a bit of time with it because it's quite beautiful. Hedy has also been one of the catalysts for the formulation of this symposium. Um, a few weeks after I started working at the Hood Museum of Art, um, she, she announced her retirement from the Art Gallery of New South Wales in protest over the marginalisation of Indigenous art and culture in the Art Gallery of New South Wales. She called for an establishment of a national institution of Aboriginal art and is quoted as saying, you can only get to a certain point within a mainstream institution and I have reached that point in the Art Gallery of New South Wales. It goes without saying I've had incredible opportunities and I would like to think I have honoured the artists at the gallery but I think that we, Indigenous people, need our own place, our own cultural institutions. Hedy is disappointed, as, as, as we are, that she couldn't share some of her thoughts about the creation and vision of this institution with you. The title and composition of this panel acknowledges the complicated politics of claiming this separatist space. It references the incredible people who are, you know, it also references the incredible people who are champions of Indigenous art in this country, who are often working in isolation, collectors and museum directors. Um, you know, a reference to the problematic of conflating the experiences of Indigenous people around the world, the experiences of Indigenous artists and freelance curators, and what is happening at the moment in Australia, the polarisation of Australian Indigenous communities that has recently been played out in the media. Being the sole Indigenous voice can sometimes be challenging, and I'm sure that this is something that many Indigenous, the people on my panel have experienced more than once in their professional and personal lives. I wanted to create an Indigenous-only panel not just because I have sometimes witnessed the kind of destruction of the conditions of kind of listening to Indigenous people, but because I wanted to channel them. I wanted to use this platform to privilege Indigenous ways of knowing in the same way that the exhibition does upstairs to indigenise the space for the official launch in a direct and embodied way. <coughs> I wanted to invite people to think about the micro... I also wanted to invite people to think about the micropolitics of the museum and how it relates to indigenous people, people who have worked within them and worked outside of them. From 2003, from 2003 to 2010, I worked in national and state galleries and always liked the idea of indigenizing spaces from the inside out. I was fortunate enough to have Brenda Croft as, um, my, as the senior curator and mentor at the National Gallery of Australia, where she demonstrated that Aboriginal ways of doing things could really enhance the institution. Although I have a huge appreciation of the people who fought tirelessly for those dedicated spaces, of Indigenous art within mainstream institutions. Um, I know we can't take them for granted, but I don't remember a time when they didn't exist. It has become, in my mind, normalised and uncontested and expected. I liked positioning Indigenous art alongside other forms of art, giving it an equivalent value and potentially opening up new possibilities. I then moved to the National Gallery of Victoria, Melbourne, and became struggling with this uncomfortable feeling that I was cur cur curating spaces of Indigenous people and not for Indigenous people. And this is a less a criticism of the institution and more of a criticism of the curatorial method. The local community seemed to have a much stronger relationship to Museum Victoria and of course the Koori Heritage Trust, a not-for-profit Aboriginal community organisation that aimed to protect and preserve the living culture of Aboriginal people of the southeastern Australia. I took a year of absence from the National Gallery of Victoria to study in New York where I became, I had the good fortune of meeting Sonia Smolikom, who was and is still working at the UN. 
I saw the incredible coalitionary work she was doing with Indigenous people around the world and so was in this country for the signing, for the US signing of the non-binding but significant declaration of the world's Indigenous peoples. I was also at the time visiting many multi-ethnic New York organisations that emerged from the civil rights and American Indian movement of the 1960s and 70s. I was looking at how they address and facilitate issues of institutional structure, hierarchical versus horizontal, private philanthropy in public spaces, and synergistic relationships with communities, and responsive curatorial programming. I realised that I had lost a bit of interest in going back to the NGV, and instead decided to come to Dartmouth College, where I was really interested in positioning Indigenous Australian art in a really international context. Someone who's also imbuing a sense of Australia into the world, and who's always been, and I've always been interested in his work, is Christian Thompson. Some of his earlier series um, from, from 2003 three was emotional series. He photographed young urban Aboriginal people in front of artificial backdrops of cultural institutions, including the National Gallery of Victoria and Museum Victoria, holding artefacts as a comment on the historic disenfranchisement of Aboriginal people from their own material culture. At the same time, the project allowed for these momentary encounters with museum objects, to reconstitute them, to reconnect to them, to let them get under the participant's skin. This was the year I started working at the National Gallery of Australia and I saw these works as an endorse endorsement of my own curatorial practice in that I wanted it to be less about cultural preservation and much more about cultural reactivation. I was interested to see Christian's latest body of work, which he'll share with us um, late in a moment, um, the exhibition We Bury Our Own, which was inspired by his response to the photographic archives at the Pitt Rivers Museum, Oxford that holds one of the most significant collections of 19th century of Aboriginal Australian people. Along with an intersecting Australian research grant to research and return four major European collections to Indigenous communities in Australia, Christian's project enacted a performative, devotional, and as Christian called it, a spiritual repatriation of the archives. <laughs> Many of the works in the series depict crystals which have this strong associations with healing, and there is a sense of trying to relieve and move beyond the inherent tensions of anthropological imagery of Indigenous people and to forge a new museological approach. For Christian, these objects are a type of notation, but his artistic interventions create the necessary cultural music. I've come to realise that relationships are my politics, and I think I've invited these people <coughs> to talk about their relationships to me to you and to other Indigenous people. And I'd like to invite Brenda Croft to be the first speaker. First of all, I would like to pay my um, sincere respects to the traditional custodians of this region, um, the Abenaki people, and to all Indigenous peoples who are here today. I'm very honoured to um, be here and I don't make that statement um, uh, as a way of just paying lip service. Um, as a, a, an Aboriginal person myself uh, from the Gurindji, Malian and Mutbra communities in the Northern Territory, I do that as a means of um, uh, paying my respects and honouring the people whose country I am travelling on. And for all of us who are Indigenous peoples, um, travelling and living within Australia, we're often living outside of our traditional homelands and working with other communities. So we, we do this as, as a matter of course. It's not simply just a, a means of um, saying that we pay respect. Okay, I'll take that pause off. Um, I often sh show, I often start with my talks um, looking at a map of Australia but not the map of Australia that many people know, or certainly not what I grew up with when I was at school, which tended to divide the various states, a small number of states and territories into um, those states and territories. I look at this map as the guide for how I live my life as a contemporary Aboriginal person in Australia. And you can't read all of the different language groups here, but each colour connotes uh, a specific nation. So 
it's important to consider Australia as you would, say, Europe. It's a place of many nations and we have distinct languages, um, customary beliefs and practices, and we follow those traditions and practices. And if we, which I'll be touching on in my paper, um, discuss why we aren't able to do that, that's part of what's happened since um, the days of uh, uh, first contact in the late 1700s um, in Australia. So the lovely person who's printing out my paper, I'm going to talk a little bit about my relationship with Stephen. Uh, we go back a very long way, which is a bit scary when I was thinking about it this morning. Um, we first started working together at the Art Gallery of Western Australia 12, 12 years ago. Um, Western Australia is a huge part of the country and it's almost a third of the entire continent. Um, if you can consider how many different nation groups are within that particular state, you get a sense of the scale of what we were dealing with working um, over there. And Perth is located down here in the southwest of the country. It's the most isolated capital city in the world. Um, I was born there. I'm not from there, but um, my father and mother had moved over there in the early 60s, and so I consider myself um, under the colloquial term of being a sand groper. And that's where I first met Stephen when I was working as curator of Indigenous art at the Art Gallery of Western Australia from 1999 to 2001. And Stephen, um, intriguingly to me, turned up uh, one day at the, at the gallery with um, a friend that he was studying with at the University of WA and announced that he wanted to be a volunteer intern. And um, I quickly surmised that he hadn't really had much experience in the area of visual arts and culture. In fact, he was majoring, doing your honours in French, and is fluent in French, um, which I thought was f fantastic. He was a young Indigenous student who just had great initiative and quickly reorganised my office and helped work with me on a number of um, important projects, very important exhibitions that I worked on. And so I knew from a very um, early point in our, our friendship that he was someone to uh, really watch out for in a very positive way. And I was very interested in seeing where his career trajectory would take him. And so being here today, it, I feel very proud. I feel like a big sister. Okay. Um, as I said before, I think, now I've got to get the pause off this. I'm just going to keep clicking through these. I thank um, uh, Indigenous custodians in this area for allowing me to visit your lands on the occasion of the exhibition of Crossing Cultures, the Owen and Wagner collection of contemporary works by a contemporary Aboriginal art at the Hood Museum of Art and curated by my very dear friend and colleague, Stephen. Many thanks also to Stephen and his colleagues at the Hood for organising to bring me to Hanover. Thanks must also be paid to Will Owen and Harvey Wagner, who I seem to see all over the world when we're at events like this, um, the private collectors whose passionate vision and beneficence has enabled Crossing Cultures to be staged at the Hood Museum. Also thanks to Dr Brian Kennedy, director of the Toledo Museum of Art and whose former role with the Hood Museum facilitated this important promised bequest. Dr Kennedy was also my former boss during his directorship at the National Gallery of Australia some years ago and I very much enjoyed working with him during his time there. I'm extremely proud of Stephen's work on this, his first major exhibition, not only as a friend but also as someone who has worked with Stephen on Indigenous Australian curatorial projects since our work together from 2000 at the Art Gallery of Western Australia in the country's most isolated capital city, Perth. I had an opportunity to walk through the gallery space with Stephen yesterday and his high standards regarding aesthetic and intellectual analysis are evident, as well as in the impressive accompanying catalogue, um, which I managed to read a number of the essays last night. Congratulations to everyone involved in that. I arrived in Hanover after the past months spent on the road in many areas of the Northern Territory in Australia, which is my home state undertaking field research for my PhD, visiting my home communities of Kalkarinji and Dargaragu, which are about 10 hours southwest of Darwin by road, if you know um, Australia at all, and also working on a curatorial mentorship with Aboriginal arts workers associated with an organisation called DESART, 
the Central Australian Aboriginal Arts Advocacy Organisation, and the accompanying annual exhibition Desert Mob, showcasing works by artists from nearly 50 Central Australian art centres from the Northern Territory, South Australia and Western Australia. Being on the road provides me with a great sense of freedom and the opportunity for some much needed time to process what I've just experienced and think about where my research is heading or taking me. With that in mind, the images in this PowerPoint deliberately focus on mainly Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people I've had the good fortune to work with. Can I also say I'm really pleased to see babies here in this audience. I love it when people bring their kids along. And I'll take any noise as a sign of positive reinforcement. <laughs> Um, I've had the good fortune to work with and places on that journey I have visited throughout my career as an artist, curator, writer and most recently academic, rather than focusing on works of art, as you'll have plenty of time to look at the amazing um, uh, collection and gathering of works upstairs later on. I have also very much taken direction from the title of this panel, Together Alone, The Politics of Indigeneity and Culture in Australia. From my standpoint as an Indigenous person working in this cultural sector, Indigenous Australian arts and culture is inextricably connected to the politics of being Indigenous in Australia today. In my experience as a multidisciplinary arts and cultural worker, there's a tendency to disassociate the works that we view in galleries and museums from the people who have created them and by extension to not acknowledge the disparity experienced by the majority of Indigenous people living in Australia today. I am also keeping in mind the sage advice imparted to me by an Aranta elder, Margaret Kamara Turner, at the recent Central Land Council Women's Law and Culture meeting, held just outside the ironically named community of Utopia, northwest of Alice Springs in the Northern Territory which I was fortunate to attend. This annual occurrence was celebrating its 20th anniversary under the imminent threat of being the last occasion for such a significant event due to a mix of federal and state funding cutbacks, government cutbacks, the ongoing and nefarious undermining of Aboriginal controlled and determined practices, accompanied by a global swing towards religious, spiritual and sec secular conservatism and fundamentalism and reactions against and for. The Women's Law and Culture Meeting was not an open festival or cultural event, like that which I had just attended previous prior to that in Alice Springs at the Ara Lewin Centre, the Desert Mob Exhibition and Symposium organised by Des Art. No visual or recording, audio recording devices were per permitted, nor could any of the participants leave the grounds of the campsite once the ceremonial aspects had commenced. This was enforced after a senior community leader breached this rule, with she and her group being made to leave by the most senior traditional co owners of the region. M.K. Turner said to our camp, keep your pictures of this in your head and in your heart, not on your camera or your phone. This is very special. Comparing the consecutive events, Desert, Desert Mob, and the Women's Law and Culture camp or meeting, reinforced for me part of the concept of inside and outside cultural knowledge and experience. Inside being for those participants allowed to know, see or share in a cultural experience that is not for outside, that is public consumption. And I use that last term deliberately. As Aboriginal visual cultural expression has too often been treated as a consumer item by many in the wider public. This statement isn't directed at any individual but underlines a concern that I and many of my Indigenous colleagues working across the Indigenous arts and cultural sectors have increasingly felt impacting upon our ability to continue working with personal and professional integrity within these sectors. It has certainly been a factor in my choice to move from the public gallery system towards academic research and development. One of the early images in my PowerPoint presentation shows a group of young, passionate, articulate, possibly fashion challenged <laughs> people, and not that we were aware of it at the time, groundbreaking cultural activists 
the 10 founding members of Bumali Aboriginal Artists Cooperative, established in Sydney in late 1987 as the first urban-based contemporary Aboriginal arts centre in Australia. All artists, some more experienced than others, we were determined to address the disparity afforded to urban-based Aboriginal artists by the broader visual cultural sector, which effectively rendered our art, and by extension ourselves, as Indigenous people, invisible, to paraphrase one-year artist Judy Watson, in that what we were creating was often critiqued as second-rate art, neither Aboriginal nor Western, but rather a pastiche of both or relegated to no person's land. A quarter of a century since that time of optimism and determination, what has been achieved by and for Indigenous Australians? Participating in not only the arts and cultural sectors, but as part of Australian society. A strange mix of what seems to be two steps forward, three steps backwards, when one considers the cultural and class myopia affecting seemingly all parts of the political and cultural spectrum in Australia. When Bunali started, we did not realise that we were creating history, not by asking for more please, sir, but demanding our equal place at the arts and cultural tables and on our terms, not the dictates and whims of others. Through dedication and determination, we negotiated our way into the hallowed halls of galleries and museums, not only as artists, but also as curators. And some of the people whose faces you see on the screen here have occupied junior and senior Indigenous curatorial positions at major state and federal cultural institutions throughout the country over the past decade or so, and there are more who aren't featured. These positions were held with pride and a great sense of obligation and responsibility. Foremost for the artists, artworks and communities represented in the collections, which sometimes clashed with the expectations placed upon us by our colleagues, supervisors and peers associated with the institutions in which we were employed. After a great deal of consideration in late 2008, I came to the conclusion that I had to leave my role as Senior Curator of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Art at the National Gallery of Australia, where I had worked since prior, sorry, where I had worked since 2002. Prior to this, I had been Curator of Indigenous Art at the Art Gallery of Western Australia, which as I stated before, is where I first worked with Stephen who then came over to the National Gallery of Australia in 2003 under an Indigenous curatorial mentorship I hel had helped initiate with a major Australian corporation called West Farmers. What had occurred in the relatively short time since the establishment of Bumali to lead me to come to this decision, particularly as my career tra trajectory seemed to be on the rise through the curatorial ranks of one of the country's leading art museums? A series of occurrences had incrementally helped me reach my decision. I had become increasingly uncomfortable with being asked for my imprimatur by parts of the sector as to which artists were the most collectible, who was leading in a given year, who was a good buy investment-wise, and so on. I was not naive enough to consider private collectors as bad, nor Aboriginal artists and curators as good. I've had many positive, lengthy relationships with many collectors and philanthropists whose passion for contemporary Aboriginal art is comparable to my own and that of my colleagues. And the Aboriginal visual arts sector absolutely needs the support of private collectors as well as cultural institutions, as there are only so many public collections to support the sector. It was more that I felt I was being compromised or compromising myself in my role particularly when a senior colleague accused me of, and I quote, hiding behind my Aboriginality, when I raised concerns about my department not being properly consulted in relation to what I considered key aspects of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander collection. Another time, what I considered to be a clearly racist comment from another curatorial colleague who asked me rhetorically, did I consider Indigenous as backward or minority? And before I could pick my jaw up off the ground, this was dismissed by another senior colleague with the comment that I was taking it personally. Damn right. <laughs> when on sick leave for an injury, and Brian will recall I may well have been the klutziest curator to ever have worked at the NGA, I attended the funeral of a very dear friend who'd taken his own life. Someone also from the arts and cultural sector, who we still miss very much to this day. 
In a tragic situation that seemed to occur at a much higher rate among young Aboriginal men than young non-Aboriginal men. I discovered on my return to the institution that my absence had been called a walkabout by a colleague. Walkabout being usually derisive vernacular associated with the alleged tendency of Indigenous people to take off wandering nomad-like for little reason. These instances may seem of little importance or consequence and, or possibly I'm too thin-skinned, but bear in mind that similar comments, put-downs and slights Base, sorry, slights based on race, accumulated over a lifetime, become more than the straw which breaks the camel's back. The weight can become unbearable. Although many of my non-Indigenous peers questioned why I would choose to leave a secure and seemingly desirable position, I was obviously not alone in feeling increasing, increasingly marginalised, with my concerns dismiss, dismissed or ignored as is apparent with the departure of several of my peers from key curatorial positions at institutions in Australia in recent times. As previously mentioned, Hetty Perkins, Aranta Kalkadoon woman, who was senior curator of ATSI, sorry, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Art at the Art Gallery of New South Wales for 13 years until earlier this year, and someone I've worked on many projects with over many years. And Francesca Cabillo, Yanua Larakia Waterman woman, who filled my former position at the National Gallery of Australia after working in numerous curatorial leadership roles in museums and art galleries across the country. Both had decades of experience between them and the respect of their colleagues in Australia and overseas. Yet both fe felt impelled to leave secure tenures due, for a diversity of due to a diversity of reasons, although Cabillo currently remains contracted to the National Gallery but she's under, undertaking her PhD and is based back in her hometown of Darwin in the Northern Territory. I cannot nor do I wish to speak on their behalf, but I do know that a desire to work more closely and meaningfully with my own community and communities, because your community is also where you are based, not simply just where you're from, was similarly shared with Hetty and Francesca. When one considers the minuscule number of Indigenous people holding senior positions at public institutions around Australia, in fact there are no senior Indigenous curatorial positions held by an Indigenous person at this time, something which should be called into question much more loudly. Hetty's position is reportedly being downgraded to a junior position, with the newly appointed Director of the Art Gallery of New South Wales recently publicly stating that perhaps an Indigenous person may not fill the position in the foreseeable future although he has since retracted that statement with a qualification, and we will wait and see what happens. Other junior positions are held by Indigenous curators, but the effectiveness of their roles has to be queried along with the obvious question as to why are highly experienced, dedicated people choosing to leave these institutions and what is being done to address collective concerns. It's as if a generation of hard work and intent to challenge the pres presentation and representation or representation of our art and culture on our terms in a contemporary, in a contemporary not solely histori historicised context, has been in undone in much the same way as many Indigenous policies and commitment to social justice and equity for Indigenous peoples and communities have seemingly been deliberately wound back or made ineffective in less than a generation of political upheaval in Australia commencing in 1996. I was reading the catalogue last night and going through the glossary, noted that Stephen had included reference to the Stolen Generations, which refers to thousands of Aboriginal children, mainly, but not always, of mixed heritage, who were forcibly removed from their families and communities since the early 1800s till at least the 1970s. The impact of the Stolen Generations underlies the experience of every Indigenous person in Australia today, myself included. Similarly, the complex issue of land rights for Indigenous peoples, access to traditional homelands, associated customary practices and traditions, and the right to expect to benefit from the incredible resources boom and rising wealth for a select few in Australia today, arguably underpins every work in Crossing Cultures and indeed every exhibition of Indigenous Australian art held in Australia and overseas in recent times. In my own people's communities of Kalkarinji and Dargaragu in the remote Northern Territory, these are the day-to-day -day concerns for the community. Like so many across the Northern Territory, 
now entering their sixth year under the despised Northern Territory Emergency Response, also known as the Northern Territory Intervention, which has seen the right to control individual or communal futures negated through the removal of land of rights to land by successive conservative and also allegedly liberal left-leaning federal governments, the quarantining of people's income, allegations of rife child abuse yet to be substantiated, suggestions that all Indigenous people are grog runners, abusers, pornography aficionados and general lowlives, thanks to the placement of signs outside these communities declaring them prescribed areas and thereby suggesting that all who reside within them to be as previously described. Communities that are effectively helpless, not hopeless, against challenging such demeaning categorisation and classification and soul-destroying insidious inferences based on race are what Indigenous communities are living with every day, an experience so far removed from the lives of most non-Indigenous Australians that little attention is paid to the ongoing injustice. The realm of visual arts and culture, literature and performance by Indigenous practitioners is one of the few avenues available for Indigenous people to have a voice to howl against the unfair go being dished out by conservatives and right-wingers. I saw my role as a curator of Indigenous art to enable a platform for these voices to be seen and heard, definitely not out of sight and out of mind. Whenever I look at works of art in public galleries, I always recall the artists who created the works such as those in Culture Warriors, the 2007 National Indigenous Art Triennial, which toured to the US in 2009 and was partially inspired by the publication of the same name by conservative US commentator Bill O'Reilly. I often think of these artists with sadness when I think of how many have passed away often much too soon, which is an indictment on the disparity of mortality rates between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people in Australia. I cannot stress the importance enough of exhibitions such as Crossing Cultures and earlier international exhibitions and commissions such as Ancestral Modern at Seattle Art Museum earlier this year, the aforementioned Culture Warriors, the Australian Indigenous Art Commission at the Musée de Cape Ron Lee in Paris in 2006, True Colours in the United Kingdom in 2004, out at Jarrah in Europe and the UK in 93, and many, many exhibitions curated by Indigenous colleagues in Australia and overseas, which enable our voices to be heard, loud and strong, sensuous, serious and satirical. Thank you. Thank you, Brenda. Um, if you wouldn't mind holding on to your questions until the very end. Um, Sonia, would you like to come up? And sure. So Sonia is, um, is currently works at the United Nations in New York in the Secretariat of the United Nations Permanent Forum of Indigenous People, of Indigenous Issues. She'll be speaking on Indigenous rights as the basis of art and culture. Um, good afternoon. I am... Um, come from an organisation that's decided to um, go green and that we will in the future have paperless meetings. And what that means is then everybody brings their laptops along and reads their speeches off their laptops. So I'm just continuing this new um, way of um, presenting. Um, as Stephen said, my name is Sonia Smallacombe. I'm um, from the north of Australia but have lived in New York and worked for the United Nations for the last almost seven years. And this is my first time here in, in New Hampshire and I'm very honoured to be here. It's a, a, um, an amazing place and um, a much quieter place to New York as well. Um, first I'd like to pay my respects to the Native American tribe of this area, the Anarchy people and recognise them as the first peoples of this land. And I also want to acknowledge other Indigenous people who are here as well today. Thanks also to Stephen Gilchrist for organising this panel and um, inviting me here today. And also thanks to my fellow panellists, Brenda and Christian, both who are very well known in the art world and I feel like I'm a real outsider here um, because um, I'm more of a... Um, a groupie 
I follow the art, but I don't actually know much about it, but I still love it. Um, I want to um, talk today probably more from a human rights-based perspective, um, mainly because I work in the United Nations and, of course, human rights is the basis of our work. Um, I think human rights does underline the theme of this panel discussion, indi indigeneity and culture in Australia. And I think you don't have to look very far in Australia or even, you know, you, you could look in your own countries, perhaps even in the USA, um, to see um, the abuse of human rights, particularly um, on Indigenous peoples. For Australia, this began um, at the invasion of Australia where Indigenous people suffered dispossession and it continues to the present day in Australia today. For me, as an Indigenous person living outside the country, the denial of human rights or, on, or the rights of Indigenous Australians was very stark on the 13th of September in 2007 when four countries voted against the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People in the United Nations General Assembly. And I'm just wondering if you could tell me who those four countries were. Somebody said that really well. Who was that? <laughs> That's right. Yes, yes, Th thank you. Um, so those four countries, as um, the um, very smart lady here in the white just told us all, um, was Australia, New Zealand, Canada and the United States. However, to their credit, those four countries have since changed their positions. However, I think this kind of left a fairly lingering doubt in the minds of many Indigenous people, and particularly in Indigenous Australia, when you look at the current situation of Indigenous people, because um, um, on the one hand, they weren't, um, those countries weren't keen to um, acknowledge the, um, or to vote for the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, which sets out the um, basic rights, I mean, those rights that are in the Declaration are rights that are in every um, United Nations um, convention. So they weren't new rights. They weren't rights specifically for Indigenous people that were new. They were rights that are out there anyway. Um, they were just collected together and put together for Indigenous people. So um, the fact that that wasn't supported, I think, did um, um, leave some doubts in, in the minds of a lot of Indigenous people. So the rights of Indigenous Australians um, has been denied on many levels and, and I guess there's nowhere more obvious than in the Indigenous arts area. And Aboriginal art in its different forms has been the medium through which laws and customs have been recorded and passed down through the generations. The designs and images used often carry deep religious significance invoking creation stories which convey the relationship of the clans with their land. So from a very early period, Indigenous Australians were asserting their relationship to their lands, the lands that were taken from them by the colonisers. So already um, you can see that Indigenous people are keen to assert their rights there. The lack of understanding that Indigenous people may actually have their own set of laws and practices also went unrecognised. These laws often govern the use of artworks and if they were breached by unauthorised reproduction, there was often punishment for those considered responsible for the breach. In Australia, in the earlier part of the last century, Indigenous artworks were being acquired by missionaries and anthropologists, and many Indigenous communities were more than willing to share much of their cultures with anthropologists, not realising the extent that it was likely to be exhibited in books and museums. For many years, Indigenous people were largely unaware of the inappropriate use of their cultures that was taking place. Often artistic works were displayed or reproduced outside the communities in ways that were completely at odds with the purposes intended by the author. By the 1970s, the beauty, and here I'm, it's, it talks about the beauty, not necessarily the understanding of Indigenous cultures, but the beauty of Indigenous art, 
was becoming recognised by a growing number of non-Indigenous people. Not long thereafter, copyright infringements appeared on the tourist market, designs being misappropriated for such things as T-shirts, clothing fabric, beer cans, postcards and cheap souvenirs. Instances of misuse filtered back to Indigenous communities, but for a long time it was assumed in Australia that copyright laws provided no avenues for protection to Indigenous artists because the works of the artists that had been misappropriated were merely reproduction of ancient images and designs that had been passed down from past generations. It was thought that the works were not original, which is a, um, um, originality is an important factor in a, in a copyright case. But by the 1990s, or by the 1980s and the 1990s, however, there were some very publicised copyright cases brought by Indigenous artists against Australian companies. And I think this really changed the way um, people started to think about Indigenous art. Um, many um, Indigenous artists were upset that their artworks were appearing on T-shirts and carpets without their permission. And there's some very well publicised cases in Australia um, on... Um, Called, one is called the Carpets case and the other is called the, the Bullen Bullen case if you want to um, look more into those cases. But certainly I think it gave um, people an understanding or a wake-up call that um, art was um, protected and that it was in the realm of um, Indigenous people's culture and that culture wasn't there to, to steal, it was there um, or to be borrowed, that the, you know this culture was there and, and had to be respected. Protests against the treatment of Indigenous Australians were always evident in, our, in Indigenous people's daily lives. In 1963, the Yolngu people of Utakala in Northern Australia sent the Bark Petition to the House of Representatives, which is in the Australian Government, in protest against the government's granting of mining rights to a company called Nabalco, over 390 square kilometres of land exercised by the Arnhem Land Reserve. If you know this region of North Australia, it is famous for its bark paintings. So the fact that the protest was written on bark, I think is a good example of asserting Indigenous rights to identity as a people and protesting in an, in, in an Indigenous way. The result was a parliamentary inquiry which recommended that compensation was owed to the Yolnu people. However, in a subsequent court case in 1972, which was called Milarumpun versus Nabalco, the Yolnu people were not able to establish their native title to common law. In the meantime, so from the 1960s to the 1970s, protests were taking place all over Australia and of course Indigenous Australians were asserting their rights in many protest marches and of course throughout through the Aboriginal Embassy that was established in Canberra at this time. And Canberra is Australia's um, capital city. In my current job, um, as within the Secretariat of the United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues, I get many visitors and they all ask me one question. And the question is, what is the biggest issue for Indigenous people around the world? For me, it is marginalisation and the lack of recognition of Indigenous people's rights. So right across the board, right across the world, I, for me, I think the, the biggest issue for Indigenous people is the mar our marginalisation or the marginalisation of Indigenous people and a lack of respect for Indigenous people's rights. The, this marginalisation and lack of recognition of Indigenous people's rights is very evident in the art world. Um, Indigenous Australians, mainly from the cities, were often marginalised and excluded people within the public spaces of mainstream cultural institutions, which Brenda just um, spoke about. And of course, this was an area, th sorry, and of course, this was an area also of great, um, where great artworks emerged. In 2004, a collective of Indigenous artists formed um, Proper Now that advocated and produced artists and exhibitions that questioned established notions of Aboriginal art and identity. 
Many of these artists wanted to claim their space after decades of dispossession as Indigenous people. Some of the issues that these artists portrayed included racism, which was presented through the lens of urban Indigenous artists whose communities have borne the brunt of colonisation, displacement from ancestral lands and marginalisation by the dominant culture. Their work formed a narrative which underlined cultural alienation and displacement of Indigenous peoples since invasion. Another way of exerting Indigenous rights is through the use of language. For example, the exploitation of the language of the coloniser is a tactical device used by, proper now, used by the proper now artists. Previously captive to anthropological discourse and, and unequal power relations, they individually and collectively interrogated the histories that defined them as other and lesser. They used language in the forms of parody, irony and wit. And I have to say that same language or that same kind of language is, to, is used by many Indigenous Australians. We use this kind of language in our own homes and, and it's a kind of survival for us um, living in a, a very colonised world. One of the artists in the Proper Now Collective, um, a person called Richard Bell, describes himself as more of an activist than an artist. And indeed, many of his work is politically charged, addressing issues such as racism of Australian culture, which, sorry, racism in Australia and within Australian culture in which he finds himself. Bell's vivid and provocative paintings and videos is a challenge to Australia and others about Indigenous, peoples and the denial of Indigenous rights and its consequence of frustration and grievances um, for Indigenous people. For example, Richard Bell uses a wide range of media, including painting, performance and video, to humorously challenge the, commodi the commodification of indigeneity in the Western art market. Richard Bell's whitewashed paintings um, um, which had a, a subtitle, I think, I can't remember this, but it said something like, if I don't paint my story, they will steal my land. It's about continuing land theft and the erasure of Indigenous history and culture. Bell explains the difficulties this poses for Indigenous, indig for, sorry, urban Indigenous communities. And he talks about the Native Title Act, which is like a land rights act um, in Australia, which specifically requires Indigenous people to prove, prove that native title exists by means of song, dance, storytelling, and to prove that we are related to the birds, the animals, the insects, the microbes, the, the earth, the wind and the fire. And he points out this is a really difficult task even for, for um, indigenous people um, who've had minimal contact with um, um, colonial Australia, adding that the task for urban um, indigenous people becomes monumental and mostly impossible. So basically, if you want to claim your own land in Australia, you have to show that you've had ongoing connection to that land prior to 1788 when colonisation first occurred. And of course, this has been a, um, a great area of contention for many Indigenous people because colonialism um, has changed the way that we live and the way that we are today. So how do we reconcile Australia's past and how do we go forward? Well, that is what the Reconciliation Australia was about. Reconciliation was about unity and respect between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians. It is about respect between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians and respect for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander heritage and valuing justice and equity for all Australians. In the past, there was lots of um, language um, in Reconciliation Australia about social justice and there was a, a great publication that came out that talked a lot about the areas where Indigenous people sh um, and social justice could go hand in hand. And unfortunately, I haven't seen that um, publication for many years and I don't even know whether it still exists. <laughs> 
Um, and then there was talk about treaty, that maybe a treaty between um, Australians and Indigenous Australians was another way forward. But again, that's since fallen off the um, table, so we no longer hear the word treaty. Reconciliation Australia has go, gone some way towards stirring national consciousness of the pressing need to remedy Indigenous disadvantage, not only for the well-being of the first Australians, but also that of Australian society general, in general. So, so now we talk more about disadvantage and writing disadvantage. So the kind of long-term um, issues that were on the table, like um, talking about social justice, talking about Indigenous rights, um, talking about treaty rights, or all those things are now gone, and now we talk instead about disadvantage. Um, there's been some criticism of the work of Reconciliation Australia um, because one of the approaches has been to develop partnerships for success that involves organisations and people from all parts of Australian community to work together and find ways to achieve reconciliation. Now, I'm not saying that's a bad thing. What I'm saying is that it's, a, it's kind of a, a ship without a rudder or it's the, there doesn't seem to be a lot of direction in that um, way of going forward. Um, so there's still some confusion about reconciliation. And um, a woman that we all well know, uh, a lot of Indigenous people here know, is a lady called Kirsty Parker, the Indigenous editor of Koori Mail, which is an Indigenous newspaper in Australia. She recently stated about reconciliation, it's not that I think that current Indigenous and non-Indigenous relationship is all bad, but it doesn't quite fly either. We see occasional glimpses of what it could be, but we're a bit stuck. We bump up against each other and sometimes quite like it, but we're also careless with each other's emotions. We make assumptions and take each other for granted. We imagine slights and sweat small stuff because sometimes it's the only stuff we have. We generally get through life together but feel vaguely dissatisfied never quite managing to really take things to the next level. And I think that's um, a really good way of saying that reconciliation needs to go to another level. Other people have pointed out that we need to agree upon some shared symbols that can, be, that can reinforce cultural identity and form the basis of respect between the different cultures. For Indigenous Australians, there is a responsibility that comes with being the dominant culture. Whatever the truth of the events over which the cultural wars of the last decade have been fought, there is no argument that the impact of European settlement on Indigenous peoples has involved substantial losses in land, health, welfare and dignity for Indigenous people. Whether the intent was good or bad, the outcome was dreadful for many and for a long time and remains so for many despite the advances others have experienced. We cannot deny responsibility for what has happened, nor for the continuing unacceptable situation. A sign of respect is an essential step towards rec reconciliation. And for this reason, the formal apology to the stolen generations, so these are the, um, as um, Brenda spoke about just a moment ago, um, these are the uh, people who are forcibly removed from their families. So the formal apology to the stolen generation by the Australian government in 2008, I think, was critical. However, I would argue it did not take long for the momentum to, to almost disappear. In 2011, an exhibition was held at the Museum of Contemporary African Diaspora Art in Brooklyn, New York. It was titled, Saying No, Reconciling Spirituality and Resistance in Indigenous Australian Art. The exhibition featured sculpture, installation, painting, photography, video and mixed media works that highlighted the use of visual art as a form of social and political protest in the current in Australian Indigenous struggle for the right, to rep the right to representation. So the struggle continues. So where do we go from here? I would like to think that since 2007, when the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People was proclaimed in the United, General Assembly, United Nations General Assembly, that would be, um, there would be a new era 
for Indigenous Australians. And certainly I'm beginning to think that was the high water mark and we were now going to the low water mark, I think. Um, and I, I say that because um, in other parts of the world, um, the declaration continues to be an important part of the work between governments and Indigenous people. And there are countries in Africa, for example, and countries in Latin America that have implemented the declaration through various um, policies and legislation in their countries. And we have not seen this yet in Australia. So in a sense, I guess, I do feel a sense of gloom and doom. And, and, I, uh, and I stand here, I guess, um, disappointed, um, having just come back from Australia um, three weeks ago, um, where I felt very um, saddened about what was happening. However, um, I do at the same time feel that is, it is the arts where the assertion of Indigenous rights will continue to strive. I still have this faith that Indigenous artists will continue to assert their rights to their lands and resources and redefine our political and cultural place in the Australian landscape. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sonia. That was beautiful. And, you know, very important for people to listen. And, you know, we don't want to separate the poetry of Aboriginal art from its politics. Um, I'd like to invite Christian Thompson, um, who missed his introduction, but we all heard it. But um, um, he's currently studying at Oxford University and is a performance video and, um, and visual artist. So welcome him. Thank you. Um, oh yeah. Uh, firstly, I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional peoples of this area and thank those people, both past and present, for allowing me to speak on their country today. And I also wanted to congratulate Stephen on your um, wonderful exhibition and to um, thank Brenda and Sonia um, for being here and being able to speak with them as well and be part of this panel. Um, I'm going to talk about the archive. Um, I'm traditionally my uh, f my formal training is in uh, sculpture and textiles, but uh, these days I tend to work primarily um, in uh, with the mediums of photography, performance, and video. And at the moment, I'm uh, undertaking my PhD at Oxford University, and I'm working very closely with the Pitt Rivers Museum collection. And I thought I'd just show um, a short documentary that we made about the project and then talk about some of the work uh, and also show some recent uh, video works that I've made. Um, yeah, so. Where are you going, Brenda? Should we bring the lights down a little bit? Can we go to that? Oh. <laughs> oh, is that full screen? Yeah. 
side with a major you know, Australian Research Council project which was looking to connect a historical record with contemporary community today. to do justice to the collection and to the archive and as one of the first um, Aboriginal people to study at Oxford University and it's my responsibility to, to perform a sp the spiritual repatriation. The phrase spiritual repatriation really came out of um, conversation with, with Christian. So it's really a term that Christian came up with um, to describe how the exhibition space was refiguring relationships between the archive, visitors, and the actual ancestors you know, who actually residing in those images themselves. I think it's you know, a very powerful term because it does touch on all of that sort of legal um, museum sort of uh, literature and process, which obviously derives from you know, the physical repatriation of human remains. And all that. So it draws in all of those meanings, but it also shifts them onto a completely different ground by taking it away from the physical and into the spiritual area. In anthropological literature, the repatriation is, uh, also has, carries lots of other you know, meanings, um, more than just the, the legal um, set of meanings. Um, there's a term visual repatriation, which is used a lot in photography projects. And visual repatriation you know, refers to the process of taking copies of photographs back to communities working with them to you know, generate new meanings, histories, and also leaving copies with communities to use you know, for their own purposes, and working with local museums and things like that. So there's an established literature and process on visual repatriation. That's really the turning point where spiritual repatriation is, is sort of moving the, the debate on. The idea of spiritual repatriation is about setting something Free. It's about providing a platform or a new a gateway to kind of think about these kinds of collections and the role of the subjects within these collections. So it's not necessarily a comment on the collection, but it's a, it's a departure point from the archive into the contemporary. And I think that's something that art is able to do that a physical repatriation perhaps can't. So a physical repatriation is just about having the physical material, but you know, in a, in a traditional context, um, objects were only used in a votive um, capacity, so for ceremonies, and then they were discarded. So people would use traditional paintings to build temporary shelters out of, or they would use um, spears or coolamons, but for a very utilitarian kind of purpose. So it's actually the performance, it's actually the ceremony, which is the important part. And that's what art does, that a physical repatriation doesn't do, because a physical repatriation is just the physical object. It's not the spiritual content. The act of taking my own photograph is the ceremony. It's a contemporary kind of ceremony. That's why I wanted to create an aura in this space, a, a performative kind of aura. That's why I've used votive objects, things like candles and flowers and butterflies and crystals. So, you know, the, the exhibition is a meditative space and it's a space that can transport ideas and it can transport 
this sort of content of the archive into, into something somewhere else. Christian's engagement with the collection is, is also working with archival processes from the past in this institution and then refiguring them in a new way, so transforming the archival process at the same time. And of course, Will changed the, the archive you know, as a result of his engagement with it. So as I um, said in the documentary, this exhibition was titled We Bury Our Own and this sort of came from a uh, conversation that I had with my father and my, uh, actually at one of my aunt's uh, funerals, my father said, you know, um, uh, that's what white people love about us because we bury our own. And this is sort of like, part, sort of in one way, this is how a sort of very traditional ideology is still very much part of our contemporary reality. And working with this archive, I was really interested in this idea of, um, of uh, returning some sort of element, the essence of these images, and especially the uh, subjects of these sort of deeply ethnographic images uh, back into the um, uh, shifting the archive into the contemporary and um, uh, but as as another with another Aboriginal person, um, so this idea of uh, setting um, the the subject free, and I sort of thought the idea of carrying these images around to just be incredibly uh, morbid, and I I didn't want to really sort of um, uh, actually have the physical objects. What was more important, I think. Um, historically when artists have worked with museum collections it's always a sort of comment on the museum space and artists like Fred Wilson or James Luna who have who often reconfigure parts of the collections to reveal um, sort of uh, historical um, um, uh, conflicts or um, um, events for me this wasn't really really important because I sort of thought okay well the at, at one stage it was really important for artists to um, uh, to gain access to the museum space but now it's actually quite commonplace to see artists working within museum institutions and for me it was much more important to meditate on these images as I said in the documentary and to allow these images to become part of my um, life and as a consequence part of my work and um, Roland Barthes talks about this idea of the portrait and the idea that in each portrait there's a sort of there's three sort of uh, modes um, functioning and that is the way that the photographer intends to represent the subject the way that the actual the photograph um, you know manifests itself and also the intention of the subject um, of how, of, of how they want to be represented. So for me, it was much more important to access the intent of the subject and to transform that through studio practice, which is a, um, a kind of different form of research into something that created an interface or a gateway to think about these collections beyond the sort of ethnographic and beyond the kind of... Um, uh, um, beyond being these sort of heavily laden um, uh, objects. Um, 
So that a lot of the work that I've been doing really work is about reanimating or redistributing um, traditional ideas or relationships to land and how to think about doing this within a sort of global um, economy. Um, so in addition to this body of work, We Bury Our Own, I've also been doing, there was a video work which was part of this, which was called Brother. And I've been working a lot with language as well. My, as I said, my formal training is in sculpture and textiles, but I was, in my undergraduate years, I was building a lot of uh, wearable sculptures and then um, uh, documenting them. So it sort of just as a natural evolution, photography became a, um, um, a convenient way to document the performative uh, nature of my work. And then the performative has sort of um, become the focus. So there's been this sort of uh, transgression in my practice from documenting performance to creating videos to real performance. In 2007, I moved to Holland and I um, undertook a Masters of Theatre at the Amsterdam School of Arts. And I really went there to develop the performative aspect of my work because I knew that if I was going to grow artistically that I had to take some real risks and to put my physical body into the art space and to um, uh, develop the sort of performative um, um, uh, aspect of my of work that's, that has always been there. So this video work, um, where I come from, we sort of speak a hybrid of, uh, of Bidra and English. We sort of grow, we grew up with language and um, I was always, um, I was always sort of taken with the, the sort of innate lyricism of our language and I wanted to celebrate that. I asked my father once, do we have any songs left? And my dad said, well, no, we don't. And I just thought, well, I'm not having this. So I started making my own songs. And um, fortunately, a dentist came to work in our area in the 60s and he learnt Bidra because a lot of the older people in South Central Southwest Queensland didn't speak English. So he just picked up the language. And I think that's uh, also a testament to the sort of the, um, how dynamic Aboriginal culture is and how it's managed to survive through so many different kind of, um, uh, I mean, I'm really interested in this the idea of how culture manifests itself within the context of another culture. And um, I mean, you only have to look at this panel to look at how dynamic our culture is and how it's um, really stood the test of time. Um, so what was I saying? <laughs> this work, yeah, so we actually have access to um, our language in documented form. And so I began writing songs which were in part sometimes um, uh, translated by my father and then also taken from the archive. So I was really interested in this idea because our language is endangered and there are very few people who speak it in the world. I was interested in how to find a context and a platform to celebrate the sort of innate lyricism of our, lyricism of our language to uh, work with very universal ideas about sort of kinship or different sort of... Uh, the relationship of father and son, or sovereignty and connection to land, and um, how to um, to represent this in the in the art context. So I began when I was at Das Arts uh, writing songs and then performing them, but I wasn't really the sort of idea of um, just standing behind a microphone and singing just wasn't really. Some, I just sort of thought it's been done, not really interested in um, presenting these works in that way. And um, in 2010, I was invited to be part of the Sydney Biennale. In fact, I'll show that work first because this is the first work where I collaborated with a um, opera singer to create these video works where I'd written songs and I create sort of create the composition and 
and the melody and garage band and then I work with opera singers to do their own renditions of these songs that I've written and I think it really at the center of these works what I'm really interest, uh, interested in is the fact that if Bidra is being spoken somewhere in the world even if it's one or two words then it's not a dying language that it's part of a global um, uh, it's part of a global sort of diaspora and um, art is really a, co a context to art for me has given me a context to uh, archive language and music is a really great way of sort of communicating that so anyway, I'll show the video show this 
Oh, so <clears throat> there's sort of been a natural progression in these works from um, the performance of, of creating songs to the sort of interpretation of them in operatic form. And now I'm even moving further away from, from music and now I'm actually creating kind of audio environments. And what, what sort of attracts me to uh, my own language is, well, firstly, it's been a sort of central aspect of, of my own identity and life, but also that language is really such a, an integral part of how we define ourselves and how we communicate with each other. And in 2010, the same year that I made the Dutch, the Dutch Baroque opera uh, video, I was invited to be part of the Adelaide Biennial of Australian Art um, uh, called Before and After Science. And I created a sound uh, installation, which is actually using the word muna, which means bee, and nuwal, which means swarm of bees, and I worked with a sound designer in Spain and we created this work called Decent Extremist. Um, I, I like the, the idea of this sort of, of being extreme, but um, uh, standing up for something that's worth fighting for. And I think that language is such, is, um, uh, is such a powerful tool. And so um, we actually created, replicated the sound of a, a, a bee swarm using sampled uh, audio samples of my voice saying the word Muna and Nuwal, which was actually, you could hear it in the intro of the, document, of the documentary, and then fitted it, uh, inserted this, the uh, voice samples into the sound al algorithms of a bee swarm uh, to replicate the sound. So um, moving away from this idea of communication or the way that I'd use language as a kind of form of sort of poetry, I'm now using it to actually um, uh, animate the um, the actual meaning of of the of the words. Um, so I'll just play like a little sample of this. It might be good to like turn the lights down and if people want to close their eyes. That could be cool too. <laughs> 
it. The work goes for about an hour and it sort of builds in intensity. Um, I'm just going to show one more work, which is a work that I made in 2010 called Heat. Uh, and this is a collaborative work that I did with a, a Dutch harpist named Evanette van ha at Scarhorst. Um, and uh, yeah, I think I'll just show the work. <laughs> Thank you. 
I think I'll leave it at that because I think we're kind of running out of time. Yeah. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. She's kind of sent her siren daughters for us. Um, I wanted to open the floor to questions if anyone wanted to direct a question to me or any of the panelists. Michael. No, I just did, I did it really as a purely sort of aesthetic decision. I just wanted people to focus on the uh, on the language rather than any sort of artifice. So that just seemed like a really an easy way to sort of simplify um, the um, the aesthetic of those works. But it's funny because other people have brought up that issue and sort of accused me of humiliating people. <laughs> um, but no, it was really just, um, yeah, it was just an aesthetic decision, really. Thank you. Yes. There's a microphone coming down if you want to. On the map, on the map that was uh, shown, uh, a very large number of Aboriginal uh, nations was shown, and that got me to wondering to what extent, if any, um, does uh, conflict or contention among groups play a role in the politics of um, art in, uh, among indigenous people in Australia today? Did you say amongst the art or among generally, just generally? Um, I think what Sonia was talking about in terms of um, touching on the the conflict that's arisen out of native title has tended to play a great role in people being played off against each other and the onus being placed on indigenous groups to prove that they have connection with country and in fact, um, the former Prime Minister, Paul Keating, who was Prime Minister, I can't remember when he started being Prime Minister, but up until 96, he gave an amazing speech uh, called the Redfern Speech in 92, I think it was, 93, in Redfern, which is a, um, a suburb um, very strongly associated with um, urban Aboriginal rights. and. He was a great um, proponent of acknowledging past wrongs and owning them and not necessarily saying that people need to feel guilty about them but to take some responsibility for living in the country here and now. He has also just recently come out and stated that native title should be turned around and the onus should be on the people, non-Indigenous people who are wanting access to that country to prove that they should have a right to access that country rather than the onus being placed on Indigenous groups. Certainly, with differing nations, um, depending on who the nations were, there was sometimes conflict, but there was also a great deal of trade. There was a lot of exchange between peoples right throughout the country. Um, you, I was just talking to my cousin recently. Um, there was a big land rights, um, uh, an event, a very important event nationally in 1966 with um, the Gurindji walk off from Wave Hill, which was, which has been acknowledged as the, the birth of the national land rights movement. And um, I was asking my cousin now, tell me, I've got to get down all the names and make sure I've acknowledged all the different groups that were involved you know, in the walk off. Because even though it's called the Gurindji walk off, there were six different nations. There was Gurindji, Mutbra, Malian, Bilinara, Nyaranman, and Walpri. And my cousin writes back to me, those first five are all right, but those Walpri. <laughs> <laughs> Which made, made me laugh. And, you know, there's contention with um, Larger Manu, say, for example, which is a community near 
to um, Kalkarinji and Dagaragu. Large amount is actually on Gurindji country, but the population there is Walpuri, so people have been moved around as well um, since times of uh, first contact in the late 1700s. And so there's those kinds of conflicts, but there's also a great deal of um, people, you know, negotiating with each other and working with each other and due to trade or intermarrying or exchange of goods, etc. So you could see it as similar to Europe as well in that not everybody gets along and we see that all the time with the ch changing nation states and borders. Uh, <coughs> Mr. Gilchrist, uh, assuming, because I, I'm speaking from my own ignorance, assuming that what you're presenting upstairs is in a form that it may not be common in the indigenous communities, but is designed to be consistent with showing in non-indigenous communities such as this one. Uh, is what you have been, are showing us here having an impact on any parts of the communities, indigenous communities? Is there a feedback? Are they seeing are they understanding themselves better, as we all do when we watch, our, look at our art? As in museums, we go, we understand more about ourselves. Is what you've done here, collected here, having any impact on indigenous communities in Australia? Well, I ask myself that question all the time. You know, you want to have some kind of benefit some kind of takeaway that is positive and you know I think indigenous people are very proud to be you know they know they're very proud of being in international exhibitions you know they very aware sometimes of their own kind of celebrity in the art world I think and and and, and agency as well you know they explicitly make work for the art market you know, it circulates in, you know, a kind of moneyed economy. They get a financial benefit. They also get, you know, the celebrity endorsement of that. It's also about presenting a, an opinion. Yeah, and, you know, th they're presenting stories about cultural sustainability. They're, they're presenting their ancestral narratives. I mean, I think there's enormous amounts of cultural pride, um, I you know, invested in the work. It actually has kind of like legal currency as well. Like my cousin recently wrote to me and they're using my work as a example of how our culture has survived through our native title claim. Mm. So it's a really cool, very practical way that, that art actually has mm. a very meaningful place within contemporary um, culture and society, yeah. It's really cool. Um, following on from that question, um, both uh, Stephen and Brenda, you raised the um, you raised the issue of a separate institute uh, for um, Indigenous art, which I think in, in Australia is something that is um, urgently needed. But uh, and I'd, I'd really like to hear your thoughts further on that. But I would also put forward and, and be really curious to hear um, your response, both having worked in major institutions, that in fact a bigger problem is finding platforms for critical engagement across cultures with um, indigenous work and contemporary work uh, being produced around the world. And I know this is something that um, you've worked on quite a lot, Brenda, doing um, uh, parallels with indigenous works around the world, but I, I kind of wonder if we're um, starting to think of indigenous art as the, uh, not only you know, the preeminent Australian art, but really internationally a preeminent form of contemporary art, um, how in the context of a separate institution like a national indigenous centre, we can continue to foster um, those intercultural dialogues where indigenous art is placed alongside the world's leading contemporary art and shown to be um, speaking the same, you know, uh, speaking the same critical terms, if in a different, uh, if in a different uh, artistic language. Well, I think I've come to realise that I'm less concerned with the spaces that I work in and the people that I'm working with. You know, I don't think we necessarily, um, you know, have to. Ha it's very difficult to come up with first of a building and a collection for a national institution. You know, I also like. Um, you know, the cross-cultural dialogue that we're explicit, explicitly staging in this um, exhibition. 
um, you know, not just in terms of internationally, but you know, between Indigenous peoples, um, you know, Arakoon and Lockhart River and those kinds of juxtapositions. Um, you know, I think. Oh, you say what you have to say, and then I'll think of. Look, I think there's there's arguments for and against, and there will always be that. There'll be naysayers. There will be people who will champion it. When I was at the National Gallery, there was talk back then of what is now the Australian Museum of Democracy, the old Parliament House, um, being dedicated to a, an institution that was solely for Indigenous visual culture from Australia. And I can't tell you the number of heated emails I got from people saying, no, oh, no, this is going to be, this will be another way of ghettoizing Indigenous art, blah, blah, blah. And I, uh, is that one of those bees? <laughs> I, um, Sorry, I didn't turn off. Infiltrating. Um, I absolutely <laughs> understand and support the stance, Hetty's particular position, and I think it comes after, like her, having worked within those institutions for many years, and you do feel like you're banging your head up against a brick wall after a while. Um, and just over you know, this, what I think are the simplest of things, the terminology that gets used around des describing or confining um, how uh, Indigenous art is seen and contextualised. And it, it can be done in multiple ways. There isn't one way of presenting it. I'm, you know, I'm really interested in seeing lots of different ways. And shock horror, what if you did have a, an institution that was solely dedicated to Indigenous Australian art and you showed non-Indigenous art in it as well? Um, you know, it's, it's all of those kinds of things. It's like basically telling people to get over it a little bit. Um, I think... I've heard the argument the other way from um, some amazing contemporary uh, First Nations artists or Native American artists here post-commodity from the States who are in the Biennale of Sydney and uh, one of the guys involved with that and I think they do great work and there was a couple of slides being shown of an installation they did within the space at the Art Gallery of New South Wales in the Yurubana, Year of the Banana, Yurubana <laughs> Gallery at the Art Gallery of New South Wales which is like down, 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 down <laughs> into the dungeons and they they did an intervention where they actively carved up a huge slab of this granite out of the floor and then had some wonderful sound piece that was operating within that. And I said to one of the guys, the only reason that you were allowed to do that is because you're exotic indigenous. I can tell you right now, <laughs> if that had been put forward by anybody associated with the department at the Art Gallery of New South Wales or a local Aboriginal artist, it wouldn't have happened. And he was very much against the idea of the National Museum of the American Indian. And I've, got, I've worked with colleagues from that institution and I know within that institution there are concerns about what kind of shows you present. And, and I've had colleagues who say, oh, we need to do the teepees and pony show because that's what the pu general public's asking for. That's what they want to see. And, of, you know, these are all the kinds of things that you're fighting against or d dealing with within your own kind of structures as well. So I think... As Stephen says, we, d we wouldn't, I don't know where the collection basis would come for a national institution in Australia, but I certainly think it <laughs> could only um, benefit and add to the, the current dialogue that's going on over there. And if it was, it has to be um, personed and run and directed by um, Indigenous Australians. And take in temporary shows, you know, build the collection on that, um, <laughs> do different things that are there. but. It certainly would beat the kind of frustrations that are experienced working within some of those big institutions because you've, you're made to feel once you're there, you should be grateful that you're allowed in and that you should start acting white. And if you challenge, and I'm speaking from personal experience, I'm not speaking for anybody else, but I'm just saying my experience within that, and I've got a pretty loud voice. If you don't have a loud voice, you tend to just get beaten down or you leave. Are there any other questions? We're oh, Brian, please. 
think I think there's moments when it can be purely um, for show, and I remember feeling really uncomfortable many years ago at an opening of, at the Museum of Contemporary Art, and there was a, a group of very senior women, I think from I can't remember which community, sorry, um, in Central Australia, and I felt uncomfortable participating in this kind of ogling voyeurship of you know and I was watching people standing there with their glasses of champagne and chattering away and talking and and I thought what kind of engagement is actually going on here you know but when it, when it's really effective and really important um, and I don't want to use this as an example a show I curated but I'm just thinking of um, beautiful man senior leader from Arakoon who passed away recently and I won't mention his name but he performed at the opening of Culture Warriors with his Great grandson, and he, they danced together, and it certainly wasn't just the idea of we'll just do something as a, you know at the beginning. It was about making sure that his work could be in that place and that space. It was about in the investment of cultural exchange and transmission of knowledge between him and his great grandson, and it was it was a really moving experience. And so it depends on how. Um, how institutions approach it and that's why it's so important I think to have indigenous people working within these places even though I left where I was um, I think it's really essential to listen to really listen to the voices of people who are working there to look at how our um, art and culture and and customary practices are presented and represented so you know, it, it's one of those things that has to constantly, constantly be assessed and taken seriously, not just added on as a, a kind of, you know, 60 second intro and then, then we'll get on with the rest of the real show. Well, um, please join with me in thanking our panelists today. <laughs> And, and please know we have our exhibition opening that starts at six o'clock and you're all very welcome to stay. So thank you so much. <laughs>